Good morning to everyone and welcome to the well here at STSA. Happy first Sunday of the new year for us at least. I know we've had another Sunday, but this is our first one back at the well. And before we start today's message, I got two kind of things that I off the top of my head before I get into today's message. The first thing I want to share to you how I'm feeling right now, because I'm all into feeling my emotions and being more in touch with my emotions in the new year. That's my thing. Okay. So number one, I'm very happy to be here. Are you happy to be here? It's good to be back. Okay, every year when we take off for the the Christmas and the New Year's and we kind of disrupt the schedule, I'm always like, oh, it's great to be home. It's great to have a a lighter schedule a little bit. It's great to kind of get out of the norm, and it is. But now that I'm back, it's good to be back. It's good to be back because this is where we belong, right, church family? Like, this is where we belong. We don't belong out there having brunch on Sundays, okay, with those people who have brunch. We belong here in the church, so I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you're here. The second thing I want to share with you. As for those who walked in a little bit early, you saw we had probably 1 billion technical difficulties before starting here today. 1 billion is an approximation. Thanks be to God, we have hardworking people over there running around everywhere, so we got all the screens to work, the music, everything worked out okay in the end. But whenever I see a lot of technical difficulties, I know that God has a very powerful message on that day. I know that God wants to deliver a very strong message, and that's why there's got to be a little bit of disruption and distraction to try to distract us from it. So I'm doubly excited today, not just to be back. I'm doubly excited because I believe God has a very special message that he wants to share with us at the start of this new year. And speaking of new year, let me start off with a confession. I am a New Year's junkie. I love New Year's. Okay, It is my favorite holiday, and I know that these days, for some reason, I don't know why, Okay, New Year's isn't as popular with others as it used to be, at least when I was growing up. I love New Year's. I love all things that are step back, take stock, inventory, come up with plans, come up with goals, anything where I can create lists with check boxes. Okay, that's like, I'm all about that. Spreadsheets. So I love New Year's. I love New Year's. I love New Year's. But like I said, I think I'm like in the minority these days because the cool thing apparently is not to love New Year's. You know how like Christmas has a Scrooge who's like bah humbug? I feel like everyone is this New Year's Scrooge where they're like, oh, resolutions are outdated and oh, you shouldn't waste your time with that. And I'm like, when did it become out of style to try to improve your life? I don't know where that is. I looked up online a poll of Americans' favorite holidays. Anyone want to guess where New Year's ranks on the favorite holidays? Well, let's start at the top. What do you think is the favorite holiday in this country? Christmas is number one. Thanksgiving is a close number two. Okay, those two are at the top. Three, anyone guess? Halloween. Who said Who St. Said Patrick's Day? What you doing on St. Patrick's Day? Okay, St. Patrick's Day. Don't tell me St. Patrick's Day. Halloween was number three. Number four? Fourth of July. Number five? Easter. Six is where New Year's falls in. So I'm looking at this list, and I'm like, these people are clueless. Okay, whoever made this list, first of all, they got Easter at five, and Halloween, a.k.a. the devil one, is above Easter, okay? So clearly whoever made this list doesn't know what they're talking about, and New Year's doesn't come in till number six, and I just don't know why people are opposed to New Year's, because here's what something, I learned this a long time ago, I think I read it in a book, I heard it in a sermon, I don't know where, where it was, but every year, I remember this, and you probably heard me say this before, okay, the reason why New Year's is important to me, because of this statement, that's a game changer if you understand what it says. It says, everyone ends up somewhere, but not everyone ends up somewhere on purpose. Everyone ends up somewhere, but not everyone ends up somewhere on purpose. In other words, in life, but we'll take it in a microcosm, we'll take it just for this year, but it really applies to all of life. All of us have aspirations. You have things that you want to accomplish. You want to build your marriage. You want to have a stronger marriage. You want to get closer to certain members of the family. You want to fix some broken relationships. You want to take the next step in your career. You want to ditch that bad habit or that addiction. You want to finally get healthy. Like you have lots of things that you want to do. And what I say to you is you can accomplish any of those things, but you can't do it by accident. So you can have a better marriage, but it's not going to be by accident. You can get in better shape, but it's not going to be by accident. You can take the next step in your career, but it's not going to be by accident. You're going to end up somewhere at the end of this year. You are going to end up somewhere. But the question is, are you going to end up somewhere on purpose? Think of it like driving a car. All right, you get in your car today after we finish up here. You can go anywhere you want. You can go anywhere you want. 
You can drive to your house. You can drive to my house. You can drive to uh, Maryland. You can drive to West Virginia. You can drive to Canada. You can drive to, like, you can go wherever it is that you want. But what are the odds that I just get in the car, close my eyes, start driving, and end up at a five-star resort in Cancun? It's not going to happen by accident. You can get there if you're intentional about it. So that's how I feel about New Year's, is that everyone ends up somewhere, but not everyone ends up somewhere on purpose. So I want, as I approach this new year, is I want to get somewhere intentionally. Like I want to be somewhere at the end of this year, and I want to be part of the process to determine where that is as opposed to just wherever the wind may blow me. Think of this. Imagine there's a new bank that opens up in your neighborhood, and this new bank has a very strange policy. What they do, if you have an account with them, then they will deposit in your bank account every Monday morning, they will deposit $10,000 in your bank account. Every Monday morning, you get $10,000 deposited in your bank account. But there's the catch. The catch is you have to spend it all by the end of the week. And any leftover that you have, you lose that. So you only spend a dollar, you lose the rest of it. But you can use that $10,000 however you want. You can use it to, 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 to go on vacation. You can use it to buy a new car. You can use it to pay off your debt. You can use it if you really love God and want to do something really blessed. You can buy a gift for your, your priest. Okay, like whatever. Okay, like it's up to you. But at the end of your week, whatever wasn't spent gets thrown away. What would you do if, that was your, if you had that situation? Would you waste a penny of that, that $10,000? Would you waste a penny? Of course you wouldn't. Well, you know what? Every Monday, God gives us 10,000 minutes. 10,080 if you want to do the math, okay, but 10,000 minutes. And you have 10,000 minutes this week. You could do whatever you want with it. Some people will use those minutes to try to cure cancer. Some people will use it to binge watch whatever dumb show is the next latest thing on Netflix. Some people use it to build relationships. Some people use it to isolate themselves even further. Like you choose. You get 10,000 minutes a week. And in the end, it's your choice what to do with it. And the sum total of your year will ultimately be how you spend those minutes. The Bible says it this way, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 16. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Again, see then that you walk circumspectly. And I'm going to put in parentheses, live, because how you walk is another way of saying like live your life. Live your life circumspectly. You know what circumspectly means? It means like, like circumspectly means you're not just walking like, like this through life. It means that you're walking and you're seeing where you're going, and you're circumspectly what's behind you, what's in front of you, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, not as suckers, not as people with their head in the sand, people who understand that the days are evil. What does it mean the days are evil? Days are evil doesn't mean that, like, is, are wicked. What it means is, said another way, time is not on your side. Time is not on your side. The days go by quick. And if you are not intentional about it, they will fly by and you won't even know it hit you. A couple days ago, we had a a gathering at my house of the 20-somethings. Any 20-somethings in the room? 20-somethings? 20-somethings? Very few 20-somethings? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Not the most energetic group in the church, apparently. Okay, but we had a group of 20-somethings at my house. And we were talking about, like, New Year's. And we were talking about what's the earliest New Year's memory that you have. Like, think of the first New Year's that you can remember. And someone, one of the elder statesmen in the group, said, Y2K. And then I said, oh, yeah, I remember Y2K because I was a consultant at the time, and I was actually on a Y2K project. And this one girl had, like, the most puzzled look on her face, and she's like, what's Y2K? And we were like, I'm laughing. And another girl's, like, explaining to her, she's like, it's the fashion, Y2K fashion. They're talking something fashion. And I'm like, what's happening in this room right now? And then it hit me. Half the people in that room were not born in the year 2000. And these are like real people, not people on TV. These are like med students. Like you may, like you may go to a doctor's office and be treated by somebody who doesn't know what it means to party like it's 1999. Like they don't even know what that expression means. <clears throat> That's what it means that the days are evil. I think of 1999, 2000 like last week. Like I remember it. And for other people, they're like, oh, that was... That was before they were even born. That's what it means by the days are evil. Time flies. And I'm telling you, you're going to look back at some point on 2024. You're going to say, oh, 
yeah, I remember. But the time flew. And that's going to be 2025 and 26 and 20. Like that. That's just how life is. That's what this verse means. At the end of this year, you're going to end up somewhere. But the question is where? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be at the end of this year? Like, do you want maybe, let's just brainstorm here together. Maybe this is the year that we finally, and fill in the blank. This is the year that we finally get over the hump spiritually. That we stop messing around. That we stop with like the, yeah, I go to church when the weather's nice, and then I don't go because there is, like I said, brunch plans, okay? As if it's the only day that you can eat brunch, okay? Or this is the year that I finally stop being a consumer at church, and I'm like, okay, you know what, Father Anthony, Father Timothy, I'm ready to get in the game. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves. How can I help? I'm, I'm ready to stop like just being like a taker, taker, taker. I want to give back. Speaking of give, maybe this is the year that financially, I'm like, you know what? My finances are all out of order. All I do is for myself and just buy stuff to make. Like, uh, this is the year that I'm going to get my finances. I'm going to invest in something bigger than myself. Maybe you say work. This is the year that I finally stop talking about being balanced. I stop talking about working less. I stop talking about I need to be more invested in my children. This is the year I stop talking about it. This is the year I actually do it. You fill in the blank. Where do you want to be at the end of this year? You will end up somewhere, but you will, the question is whether you end up somewhere on purpose or not. For some of us, 2024 will come and go and we'll be in the exact same spot. And you'll be tempted to say, oh, the cards were stacked against me this year. Or you'll be tempted to say, oh, bad luck. Or you'll be tempted to say, God is not on my side. You'll be tempted to say all those things. But the reality is, where you end up at the end of this year is going to come down to those 10,000 minutes that you get at the start, those 10,000 minutes, and how you invest them, and where you spend them. <clears throat> so, what I want to do today, I want to share one thought to guide you into 2024. One thought that God has really put on my heart that is going to guide me in this new year. I feel like God is really putting it in front of me, and it's based on if you were here on New Year's Eve, for those who were here, I know a lot of people travel on New Year's Eve, but what we did on New Year's Eve, for those who weren't here, is we had a beautiful time in prayer and praise, and it was fantastic, and it was so uplifting, and it's just the best night ever, okay? And it's especially great because it finished before midnight, okay? We don't do the midnight thing, like, my age, it's like, it's like 8 p.m. is close enough to midnight as far as I'm concerned, okay? I got to get home before the traffic, and it's just, yeah. So we finished at like 8.30, 9 o'clock, but we had a beautiful night. And one of the things that we did is we collected a whole bunch of promises from the Bible and we printed them out on little pieces of paper and we distributed them. So everyone walked home on New Year's Eve with a promise from the scriptures, a unique promise that I felt like we prayed and said, God, guide my year through this promise. So I'm going to share with you the promise that I got, but I'm going to share it at the end. Okay, I want to explain it, then I'll, I'll share it at the end. And I guarantee you, when I share my promise... And my application of that promise, I guarantee you, you're not going to like it at first. But I believe it's what God wants for us. And I believe it's not just what God wants for me, but it's what God wants for us. And the reason I believe that is because God and I have this deal. Like, he talks to me, and he knows I'm going to share it with you, okay? Because he knows I can't keep my mouth shut on anything, okay? So, so I, God wouldn't give it to me unless he wanted me to share it with you. So even though you don't like it, here we go. <clears throat> here is the message. And I believe it might be the key to making the most of what's left in 2024 for each one of us. And that is this, is that we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I told you you'd hate it. We need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. We've all probably heard the quotes, you know, everything good in life is on the other side of fear. Okay, or, you know, the first step beyond your comfort zone is the first step where you will see the blessing of God. Like, there's like a million quotes out there that, that say something like that. Forget about the fancy quotes and the buzzwords. The principle makes sense. I'm a logical person. Many of us live a conflicted life because many of us, I should say most of us, say something that doesn't make any sense. We say we want to grow, we want to get better, we want to improve. But then we also say we want an easy life. And we want to be comfortable. And what I'm saying is those two are at odds with one another. Just think about it for your physical body. My muscles only grow when they are 
uncomfortable. If I do my best to make my muscles as comfortable as possible, they will not grow. So you can have growth or you can have discomfort, but you can't have both. Many of us, even though we would never say this, the way we're living our life is the same as a person, like in many areas of life, we're living, imagine a person who's thinking to himself, I want to get as strong as possible and build as much muscle as possible and be as relaxed as possible this year. That's how many of us live our lives. I want to build as much muscle as possible and spend as much time relaxing as possible. The two are contrary to one another. And it's not just muscle. That applies to, your, like I said, spiritual. It applies to your career. That applies to your marriage. That applies to your relationships. That applies to every aspect of life. In any area that you want to grow, and I know you have areas that you want to grow in. I know you want to be better. In any area that you want to grow, get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's the only way. We're going to look at a passage from Scripture from Matthew chapter 14, a passage I'm sure you've probably heard before if you grew up in church, a passage you probably read before, but maybe you never thought about it in exactly this way. It's about Peter. And Peter, as you know, was one of the 12 disciples, and he was kind of like the top dog of the 12 disciples. He was kind of their leader. Well, Peter had kind of a rough, shaky start in his life, but there was like a turning point in his life. There was probably a couple of them, but there's one point in particular that I always look at this point for Peter and say this was where it was like no turning back for him after this because Peter's life changed one night when he was out in a boat with the rest of his buddies after a long day at the office. We're going to pick up the story in Matthew 14, but just to give you the context. The beginning of Matthew 14, the start of the day, is when Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. You've heard this story before. A whole bunch of people, 5,000 men plus women and children. So that gets you about 20,000 people, okay? Follow Jesus. He'd preaching all day, and they said they're hungry. So Jesus said, okay, we're going to feed them, and you disciples, y'all are going to be the ones to distribute it. It wasn't like they came to Jesus. It wasn't like communion where they came to Jesus and gave him like this. It wasn't like that. Okay, Jesus gave it to the disciples, and the disciples had to go around to 20,000 people and give them each their lunch for the day. I'm a logistics person. How long would it take to serve 20,000 people? You got 12 employees. You got 12 workers. You're going to feed 20,000 people. For the math, that's 1,667 people per disciple. How long would it take Peter to feed 1,667 people? Remember, this is pre-Chick-fil-A, okay, before the drive-thru and they had revolutionized how to make things go quickly. So you couldn't just call the Chick-fil-A people and say, organize this. I would imagine this was a tough day. I would imagine this was a tiring day. I would imagine by the end of it, Peter was like, I'm exhausted. I'm uncomfortable. I just need a break. I need a rest. So he gets into a boat with his buddies at night. That's where we pick up the story. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. Jesus was alone there. But the boat, which had the disciples, including Peter, was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. The boat was in the middle of the sea. What time of day? Middle of the night pitch dark all around. Electricity hadn't been invented yet, so there's no uh, the, the towers, or there's, there's, no, there's no lights anywhere. Pitch dark, middle of the ocean, and what's the weather conditions like? The boat was tossed by the waves. Do you know what tossed by the waves means? I don't, <laughs> and I can't imagine it. I can't imagine being in a boat that goes like this and lands over here. <laughs> And then it goes like this and lands over here. Like, oh my goodness, the thought of this, like I'm the guy in the plane, like I, you know, like I'm the priest. I'm, when I'm on a plane, people are always like, okay, good, there's a priest on this plane. I'm like, no, you don't want me on your plane next to you, okay? Because I'm the guy, I'm like, what's that? What happened there? What's that? And you know when the plane does the, okay, that's what I feel, like, ah, okay, and I'm sweating and I'm drenched and I'm like praying, kingdom come, I'm repenting, I'm, I'm trying to confess my sins to anyone. I can't imagine being on this boat right here. No life jackets. No little dinghy boat, okay, that you can take and motor away. Not even some Dramamine for a guy. (laughs) What do you think Peter is thinking and praying? What do you think Peter is thinking and praying? Oh, Lord, more waves. I thank thee for thine waves. 
What do you think he's thinking? And what do you think he's praying? Get me out of here. Get me out of here. Well, probably get us out of here, but if not all of us, at least some of us, okay? Get me out of here. Stop it. This stinks. This is hard. I'm afraid. This is uncomfortable. Like uncomfortable, understatement, uncomfortable. And Jesus' response, even though he didn't respond, okay, but Jesus was listening to that prayer up in heaven, God the Father listening to that prayer, and thinking to himself, what? Oh, we're just getting started. You're saying get me out of here? we just getting started. Verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Oh, you bet they cried out for fear. Like it's not bad enough that we're in the middle of the ocean and the waves are throwing us around. Here comes the grim reaper to finish the job just in case the waves don't. Like that's it. We are officially going to die. We are officially going to die. Jesus' response to them is fantastic. If you've ever been in a tough situation and heard a sermon that really annoyed you, that really made you feel like, uh, God is just not in tune with my life, here we go. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer as I do not be afraid. Be of good cheer, smile. Smile. Be happy. Don't be afraid. Like, if there's ever an excuse, like, I know we're not supposed to be afraid, but this is the valid excuse to be afraid. We're in the boat. We're in the middle of the night. Jesus, as far as we know, is far away on the other side. And the waves are tossing us around. And here comes the boogeyman walking on the water. Like, if this doesn't classify as an excuse to be afraid, like, what does? Jesus says, don't be afraid. Peter's response is strange. Peter responds different than all the other disciples. And I know you know, what he, for the, again, those who read the story before, I know you know what's about to come. But just, I want you again to picture the moment. The 12 of them in there, frantic, the boat being tossed, boogeyman on the right. And then the boogeyman says, don't be afraid, boys and girls. And Peter's response, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And you're like, what? What kind of funny request is that? Ask for the water to calm down. Ask for the storm to go away. Ask for the sun to come out. But you ask to go out on the water? Like you're already uncomfortable here. You're already afraid here. You're going to be more uncomfortable or less uncomfortable out there? You're going to be more afraid or less afraid? Like I gave you this scenario. You're in the middle of the ocean, wave, storm, dark. You want to be in the boat or out of the boat? Anyone would vote for, I want to be outside the boat. Peter, somehow, Jesus said, do not be afraid, and somehow he did not be afraid. Somehow he heeded those words. And whether it was the Holy Spirit or a moment of temporary insanity, Peter said, hey, wait a minute. Maybe this isn't the end of the road after all. Maybe this isn't a dead end. Maybe this is actually an opportunity. And here comes the, Peter's life-defining moment, verse 29. So he, being Jesus, said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Let me repeat. He what? He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He, Peter, walked on the water. And the fact that Peter walked on the water means that he's in a two-way tie for most number of people who, who have ever walked on the water in the history of the universe. And he's tied with Jesus. Only two people walked on that water. Jesus, Peter. Often when we read this story, again, for those who know this story, what happens next is he starts drowning. Okay, because he looked down and he got afraid. And we're always like, he should have believed and he should have had faith and how weak. Come on, man, the guy's walking on the water. Okay, what have you done? Okay, and who's going to give him a hard time? Yes, he falls, and yes, he struggles, but come on, man. He got out the boat. He walked on the water in the middle of the storm. Actually, truthfully, I don't even think he walked on that water. I think if it was me, I think he, what the, by the time that's like, I think he'd have been like, hey, 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 and doing a little two-step, and nanny, nanny, boo-boo to John and James and the other guys, look at me, I'm dancing on the water right here. Are you kidding me? And notice that he didn't walk on the water 
after Jesus had calmed the storm. It was the opposite. The storm was still raging. The waves were still blowing, or the wind was still blowing. The waves were still tossing. How? Why? How? Here's what I think. I think Peter was able to look past his fear, and I think he saw an opportunity. I think Peter looked past his fear, and he saw an opportunity. An opportunity to do something incredible. An opportunity of a lifetime that those other suckers in the boat missed out on. But Peter found it. Why? Because he was willing to be uncomfortable. He was willing to go past his fear. He was willing to step out of the boat. Look, and you look upon 2024, there's a lot of great things that you want to accomplish. A lot of great things that God wants to accomplish in you and through you. I got no doubt about that. I got no doubt that God, that's who God is. God wants to heal that which is broken. God wants to restore that which has been destroyed. God wants to rebuild. God wants to revive. God wants to renew. He likes the, R, the RE things, the rethings. okay? God likes, God likes to do all those things, and that's what he wants to do for you in this coming year. But it's never going to happen inside the boat. It's never going to happen inside the boat. It all the good stuff happens on the other side of the comfort zone. I'm going to show you. I, I know I still haven't shown you my verse yet. I told you you're not going to like it, but you're, we're going to get to it. But I want to show you the verse that my wife got, okay, because two become one, so I kind of pull her verse into my verse and make it like a compound verse, okay? She got Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, which is like her favorite verse in life, which says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's what God wants. God wants to, like I said, God wants in your, in your marriage. God wants in your spiritual. God wants in your financial. God wants in your relational. God wants, God wants, God wants, God wants. God wants so much for us. So much for us. Like, come on, as a dad, who wants more? Do my kids want more for themselves or I want for them? There's no one. I see a, like a billion strollers right here. The people who got all the, the strollers, okay, what that kid wants is give me the sucky thing and get me out of here. That's all I want. But I, as parent, no, 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 I got plans for you. I'm planning your career. I'm planning who you're going to marry, that cute little girl in the, with the, in the daycare. Like, I got plans for you. Well, that's God. God got plans for us much bigger than we can possibly imagine. But again, they all happen outside the boat. They all happen outside the comfort zone. You play it safe this year, you're going to miss out. So my question to you, how uncomfortable are you willing to get in 2024? How uncomfortable are you willing to get in 2024? Relationally, you got a group of friends. And they're nice friends, but they're not really stellar all-stars or anything like that. They just kind of pass the time with you. And you, 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 you're comfortable. Here's your comfort zone with your friends. You hang out. You go out to eat. You watch TV. You talk about other people. That's your comfort zone. We know how it works. We go out to a restaurant. We fight about who pays. Okay? We go back to the house for tea. We talk about other people. That's your comfort zone. Well, how uncomfortable are you willing to get? Are you willing to step out and say, hey, guys, let's do something beneficial? Are you willing to step out even further and say, you know what? I'm actually going to maybe even distance myself a little bit from this group, and I'm going to invest in this group. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be intentional to hang out with people who are going to lift me up and bring me closer to my goals. That's out of my comfort zone. That's not easy. How uncomfortable are you willing to get? <clears throat> Your health. Your comfort zone is hiding. Hiding the problem. Covering it up. Pretending it doesn't exist. Hoping that this makes it go away. But outside your comfort zone is saying, I need help. I need help. I can't do it by myself. I need to get help. That's uncomfortable. I don't want to admit it. I don't want to talk to anyone. Your career. You know God wants you to cut back. You know God wants you to cut back. But your, career, your comfort zone, if we're honest, okay, and I'm, I'm a workaholic by my nature, so I, I'm, I'm judging myself more than anyone else. If you're a workaholic, your comfort zone is working. That's easy for you. That's not hard. That's how, like, that's how, like, uh, uh, what's my comfort zone? It's just working, so I don't have to think about anything else. 
So I don't have to deal with anything else so I can say, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Hey, we missed you in church, I'm busy. Hey, you missed your kid's soccer, whatever. Hey, I'm busy. Hey, when's the last time you read the Bible? Oh, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. That's your comfort zone. And you could stay in that comfort zone. But if you want God to do something great this year, I know God wants greatness for you this year. I know it. I know it. Just like I knew he wanted greatness for Peter. But the only way to get it is to step out of that boat. The only way to get it is to be uncomfortable. Ready for my verse? Here's my verse upon which all this is founded. And I want you to think of this in the context of that hard thing that you don't want to do. That hard thing that you're saying, I can't. Uncomfortable. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What I felt God telling me, this is me personally, you apply it however you want. You're smart enough to figure out how this applies to you. I felt God telling me, this year, there's going to be some hard stuff. This year is going to be some hard stuff, but be strong. Do not be afraid. We will be victorious. I felt like last year was a hard year, challenges year, trials. I know a lot of people, I'm not saying this about me, I know a lot of people, okay, went through some really hard times. Something happened, was in the air the last two or three months. I don't know what it is. Okay, it was, it was in the water or something like that. But I know a lot of people who went through un extraordinarily difficult circumstances in the past few months. And I get that. And I'm not trying to make light of that. But what I'm trying to say is, I feel like in 2024, that's the year for victory. That's the year that God is going to conquer. But it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be because he's going to snap his fingers and all the problems are going to go away. It's going to be because we are, we're going to be strong. And we're not going to be afraid. And it's going to be like, oh, that's scary. And we're going to face it. And oh, that's uncomfortable. We're going to go right there. We are not going to shy away. We are not going to be afraid. We are going to be willing to be uncomfortable. We're going to be comfortable being uncomfortable because we know when we are uncomfortable, that's when God works mightiest. <clears throat> it's always that way. David beat Goliath. David had to be uncomfortable. Step out that comfort zone. Daniel had to be uncomfortable in that lion's den. Oh, what it means to be in a lion's den, I can't even imagine. But Daniel went in there. He came out strong. The Virgin Mary, greatest blessing of all mankind, to bear the Son of God in her womb. It's because she was willing to be uncomfortable and accept the angel's words that she will bear a son even though she was a virgin. That's life. That's life. That God wants to give us this. God wants to do this. That's life. God wants to do this. But the bottleneck is always my willingness to be uncomfortable. My fear of being uncomfortable is the bottleneck that stops God from working mightily in my life. And because I'm in a good mood here today, I'm going to give you a bonus application, a, a way to practice what I'm saying right away, something you can practice right away so that you can start to get some momentum because whenever it comes to getting out of your comfort zone, the first step is always the hardest. So once you take that first step, the second becomes easier, the third becomes, the always the hardest is the first one. Who wants a practical application for how to step out their comfort zone? Say, I want a practical application. I want to hear everybody say, I want a practical application. <laughs> okay, since you asked, I'll give you something. That... <laughs> Y'all know what next Sunday is? Ah, oh, I wish I hadn't asked. Ah, oh. y'all know what next Sunday is? Next Sunday is Friends and Family Day, and is what I believe is going to be our biggest and best one yet. And my challenge to you, outside of your comfort zone, is to invite one person to come to church with you next Sunday, just one. And look here, I'm not saying listen carefully to my words. I'm not saying bring someone to church. I'm saying invite someone to church. Because in the end, of course, I care about whether they come, but I really don't care whether they come. What I care about is I'm faithful in the process. This is not about that person or that person or we need to fill the seats, we have a quota, or the Pope is checking our numbers. Like, this is not like that. This is not we have so many parking spaces, we don't know what to do with them. This is not that. What this is, 
is I need to be faithful in what God has called me to do, and I need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Let's be honest. We all know that when it comes to inviting someone to church, no one likes to do it. It's scary. It's awkward. It's the epitome of uncomfortable. Comfortable is talking about God here in church. Like we can talk to each other about God. We can say these like Christian words to each other, but not out there. Those are a different world, Father Anthony. We don't like to mix worlds because when my outside world and inside world collide, okay, I explode or something like that when these worlds collide. So comfort zone is here. Out there is uncomfortable. I get it. I promise you, I get it. I get it. You see me up here. I'm bold. I scream. I raise my voice to do all that stuff. Outside there, talking to a stranger that I don't know, I'm very awkward as well. So I get it 100%. But I'm also a logical person. So ask yourself this. Let me give you two questions. Number one, what is the worst thing that could happen? What is the worst thing that could happen if you invite someone to church? They say no. They would probably not sue you. They would probably not take you to court. They would probably not fight you. They would probably do nothing other than say no, and it's a little awkward for two seconds. Okay? What is the best that could happen? You may change someone's life forever. You may save a marriage. You may heal an addiction. You may give hope to the hopeless. You may bring light into someone's dark, dark, dark world that they are living in daily. And you don't even know beyond that because I always feel like there's a domino effect. Like anytime someone asks me, you know, like this terrorist or, you know, like the school shooters or whatever it is, and like, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And I always say, when I see evil in the world, my first thought is, we need to do friends and family. We need to invite people to church. And like, what's the connection? Well, it's very simple to me. I may invite someone to church who may then invite someone to church who may then tell his parents who will then talk to their neighbors and their son will then be changed and that was the kid who was going to do the whatever. I, I see it very logical. You don't know the domino effect. Like, I'm here and you're here because of something, many, many things that took place way before we were even paying attention. So you don't know when you invite someone to church what, the, what, what impact that's going to have down the road. So I look at it. The worst thing that could happen is I feel a little uncomfortable for about five minutes. The best thing that could happen is someone's life could change forever. And I'll tell you even beyond that, beyond that, the blessing that God will pour into your life when you start caring about his kids more than yourself. The blessing that God will pour into your life. We never want to be a selfish church. We never want to be a selfish church. God does not like selfish children. If you want to do something for me, show me that you care about my kids. If you want to upset me, you want to get on my bad side, Show me that my kids are in need, but you don't care because it's a little uncomfortable for you to do something about it. That you care more about your comfort than ultimately the well-being of my kids. <clears throat> so, you ask for a challenge, here's your challenge. Invite someone to church next Sunday. Up on the screen is a QR code that leads you to a website. Okay, and that's a, our, a, on, on, our web, on our webpage, stsa.church slash friends and family. That makes it easy for you. Okay, it talks about the, the series, talks about what time, talks about the location. Like, it makes it very, very easy. All you got to do is send someone that and say, my, my difficult priest, he's a difficult man, okay, he's difficult, and he said that I got to invite somebody. So get him off my back because he's a difficult man. Get him off my back, and I'm inviting you. That's all you got to do. And just so you know, we're starting a series next week, which is perfectly designed for someone who is not into church. Okay, it's called You Are What You Ask, and we're going to talk about four life-changing questions, which I believe, questions to help you get the most out of this year, okay, but really it's to get the most out of life, but we'll just focus on kind of one year at a time. But my point is, it's the perfect series to invite somebody who's struggling. So I want you to think to yourself, is there someone that you know who needs to be here? Like, we have something good here. Don't you agree we have something good here? We have something good here, right? Anyone think we don't have something good here? Okay, that's really out your comfort zone. That's really <laughs> you think we have something good here. It benefited you in some way, right? Of course it has. Well, then ask yourself the question. Is there somebody that I know that would benefit from being here as well? 
someone in my office, someone in my neighborhood, someone on my basketball team, someone that my kids play with. Is there someone who would benefit from being here? And then simply be courageous. Step out of that comfort zone and invite them to church. I'm going to show you a quote from a, uh, his name is Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. And he wrote a book about the liturgy and he was giving a, a, a explanation. You know, at the end of the liturgy, okay, the last thing the priest says, he says, go in peace. May the peace of God be with you. Okay, that's what the priest says. Go in peace. That's the very end, okay? And then he was writing about that, and he was saying, what does it mean to go in peace? He was, he was like, a, explaining the word go. Does it mean just, like, drive safe? You know, watch out for the traffic on the 14th Street Bridge. Like, is that what he's saying? Like, I hope you arrive home safely? And he says this. It's a little bit of a long quote, but it's so beautiful. He's saying, no, it is not that. It means this. It means you have been on the Mount of Transfiguration. You have seen the glory of God. You have been on the road to Damascus. You have faced the living God. You have been in the upper room chamber. You have been here and there in Galilee and Judea. What he's talking about is all the places that Jesus was. You were with Jesus in all those places. All the mysterious places where one meets God. Go now. And if you have truly discovered joy, how can you not give joy to others? If truly you have come near to truth, how can you keep it for yourself? If truly something has been kindled in you, which is life, are you going to allow anyone not to have a spark of life? It does not mean go around and tell everyone specifically religious things or use clerical phrases. It means he's saying, don't be annoying. Okay, don't just use Christian phrases and holier than thou. That's not what he's saying. But it means that you should go into the world, which is yours, with a radiance, with a joy, with an intensity that will make everyone look at you and say, He has something he hadn't before. Is it truly God has come near? He has something he never had before and which I do not possess. Joy, life, certainty, a new courage, a new daring, a new vision. Where can I get it? If that ain't motivates you to invite somebody to church, I don't know what does. Our message for today. Okay, they invite someone to church for just the application, but let's go back to the big level. Let's kind of tie this thing all together. Our message for today is God wants a great year for you. And you want a great year for you. So we're aligned. I want a great year. God wants a great year. Fantastic. I don't know what God wants to do in your life this year. I don't know. But I know exactly where it's going to happen. It's going to happen outside your comfort zone. I don't know what, but I know where. Because I know that inside that boat, Peter would have been just like everybody else. That inside your comfort zone, you'll be just exact, you'll end the year exactly where you started. Comfortable. Very comfortable. Same place, very comfortable. But I know that I want more. And I want to invite you to ask yourself this question. What might, li- what might life look like, it's a tough one to say, outside that comfort zone? And I don't have the answer for you. But what might, what might my life look like? What might the impact of a decision to step out my comfort zone? Like I said, the decision to say, you know what? Church, number one, everything else, number two. I go to church every Sunday. I don't make any excuses. Rain or shine, I'm like the mailman. Whatever it is, I go to church. And I have lunch like normal people, not brunch. What impact might that have by the end of 2024? By the end of this year, how might my life look different if I made that decision outside my comfort zone? What would happen if I took that step of faith and said, I'm sorry, I apologize? What might, what might li- my life look like if I went and said, I need help? What might my life, I can't say that expression, that's a very hard expression. What would life look like if I was willing to do something difficult and outside my comfort zone? I don't know, but I want to find out. And I hope you do as well. Because in the end, God wants to do great things this year. But if you want to realize it, you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because that's the only way to find the blessing of God. Peter found it, and he didn't regret stepping outside that boat. And my prayer is that by the end of this year, all of us will have a Peter moment, stepping outside the boat and telling everyone, it was hard, it was scary, but I'm so glad I did it. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the start of this new year. 
And we thank you, Lord, for your promise that you want to do something great this year. I pray that you would give us the courage to be willing to step outside of our comfort zone and experience what it is that you have in store for us. I know, Lord, some people here, this is a hard concept because all of us, Lord, we resist the discomfort, but I know that you can give us the strength and the courage to do it, and I know we won't regret it. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.